just gonna get set up here real quick. White and uh, blue. <clears throat> and we had just gotten to Fallen Empires. That's all that. Over here. there all right now I know it starts recording a little bit before I see the I am live thing oh, excuse me but just in case I'm gonna give it a minute or two for that to pop up and we're gonna begin properly made a few adjustments that I'll go over in a minute and should improve the overall stream quality. I've been re-watching my... Oh, there we go. Stream elements would like me to know that I'm officially live. Okay, so I've made a few adjustments. I've figured out how to enable the sound gate for my microphone, so you shouldn't be hearing any more background noise outside of this room. Um, so no more parrot acting up, no more music off in the distance, any of that. Um, right now I have my fan off because of the sound gate. If it gets too hot back here, I'm going to have to turn it back on. <clears throat> Fortunately, I don't have a webcam, so I don't need like the lighting that would make the room really uncomfortable, but uh, I don't have central air, so and there's no other fans back here. And I did notice when testing the sound gate, while it did stop, like, everything coming from all of the other rooms in the house, it meant that every time I talked, you would be able to hear the fan blowing, and the fan noise would stop as soon as I stopped talking. And that was very noticeable and very weird. So, gotta see how long I can stay comfortable back here with that off. Uh, also, from watching my own videos... Uh, I've come to realize that while it is important when building the deck the way I'm doing it to actually take notes on what the cards do and not just the names so that I don't have to look them up later, I'm spending an awful lot of time um, retyping the game text of the card. Um, so I'm not going to be doing that on the stream anymore. I'm just going to be adding the names of the cards that I'm considering, and then I will go back and add the text off stream. So that way, there's not a whole lot of time of me just mumbling the text of the card that I just read to you. So, those are going to be some of the adjustments. I think they will improve the stream quality overall. Uh, last time we got up to Fallen Empires, so we're starting there. Uh, Fallen Empires was the most recent Magic the Gathering set when I started playing. Um, it was very poorly received compared to all of the other ones and was printed way more than all of them. So you used to be able to get booster packs of Fallen Empires for a dollar a pack. And I love that because I was in grade school at the time, so I didn't have a ton of money. So actually having booster packs that I could afford to buy, as opposed to like the $2 or $2.50 that other packs were going for when you could find them because a lot of the older sets uh were very hard to find at the time like it was very difficult to find any revised or the dark or anything and anything from before that was actually impossible for me like i would see it but they would want you know like 50 dollars a pack or like unlimited or something <sighs> remember when unlimited was 50 dollars a pack I remember that. Yeah, I did buy one unlimited booster pack at like a hundred dollars back when I used to buy packs. Like I've opened literally every set except for like Alpha Beta Limited, like either of them. And I believe I don't think I ever actually opened I've opened a uh, product for Portal Three Kingdoms, but I don't think it was ever booster packs. I've opened like the pre cons and stuff for that, but I did not ever open actual booster packs of that one because I could not find any. 
Uh, everything else, including like Starter, the other two Portal sets, um, pretty much every Magic product that had regular booster packs, I have opened at least one of. Um, my Unlimited pack, like this one was terrible. So the Rare was Thought Lace, which is a blue, uh, it's an instant now, it was an interrupt back then. It turns a spell that's being cast, or a permanent on the battlefield blue. There was, like, a cycle of these cards, one for each color. Absolutely terrible. I did, however, get a Berserk, which I traded for a Tundra, an Underground Sea, and a Scrubland. So, that turned out great. But the actual rare was absolute garbage. I do still have it, though, because nobody wants that. Nobody cares about a white border unlimited thought lace. Uh, I mean, there's probably one person out there trying to put together a full unlimited set, but I'm sure they found thought lace by now. Yeah, unsurprisingly, Fallen Empires, I'm scrolling past these cards, but they're bad, but not, you know. Why do I have a blue card? Did I not turn off blue? Ah, does not contain B, it's not helping me. It's not contain blue. Add that in. There we go, all better. Like, why is there, why is there a giant angry homerid on this page? Oh, we also weren't getting black because I put does not contain B, so it, I guess if I had to put L it, or BL, it would have... Taking out blue? Okay. Ah, Breeding Pit. I was so excited the first time I opened one of these, because I love that it combines with, like, Lord of the Pit, and you'll see him later on. One, one of the weirdest, like, artwork-wise, like, early Magic cards, a lot of them have really weird artwork. Uh, but when we get to the Evan Praetor, we'll take a moment for him. But yeah, most of these cards are bad, but not, like, debilitatingly so to have. They're just mediocre. So, I don't think we're going to find anything... Okay, so here's Ebon Praetor. The, this guy right here, he, he is the Ebon Praetor. He is the monster, the 5-5 five, five, Trample First Strike, that's sitting here in judgment of all of these other creatures being dragged to the Underworld. The reason his artwork is so weird, is this giant bunny is one of the creatures that is holding down what is probably a more fearsome-looking monster. That, like, th this is the, I look silly and I am going to murder you. This has to be, like, a Monty Python-level white, like, killer white rabbit type thing. Because the other monster holding this a uh, blue-skinned creature down is this little devil-looking monster over here. So everybody here to the right of the rabbit makes sense for this awful monster. And then there's just... It's a bunny rabbit. It's a giant bunny rabbit that is holding this monster down to be judged by this thing at the gates to... Oh, uh, there's an actual card. It's, a, it's in this set... Uh, I forget whose gate it is now. We'll we'll get to it, but yeah. So, but the uh, the Evan Prayer requires a sacrifice, and if you don't sacrifice to him, he gets negative two, negative two counters on him. This is another weird thing that Magic has done away with. Counters used to be like any size and shape. There's actually armor thrall up here that you can sacrifice it to permanently give a creature plus one plus two as a counter. And so it's a 1-3, but it gives the creature a plus 1, plus 2. It loses one toughness when, when it gets torn apart in order to make the armor out of its body, I guess. But... So it could get negative 2, negative 2 counters. It also gets plus 1, plus 0 counters if the creature you sacrifice to it is a thrall. So the thralls are creatures that were meant to be sacrificed. The Ebon Hand used them for that, and then they kind of got out of control. Like, the whole Fallen Empires is about, like, two creature types in the same color uh, fighting each other over uh, the dwindling resources before Ice Age kicks in. 
and how they're, all of these kingdoms are falling apart. So, for the Ebon Hand and the Black Align group, so there are the clerics and, and uh, followers of the Ebon Hand, and then they've got like this monstrosity at the top, and there's Endric Sar, who is the one that came up with the idea, well, we, we need to keep the, uh, you know, malicious holy rites going, so we need sacrifice fodder, so he created the thralls, and then the thralls got out of hand, and the thralls overran them. Similar to how the elves started growing the thalids as a food supply, and then the thalids decided they didn't want to get eaten anymore, and they started rebelling. Yeah, we got Elvish Farmer who makes saplings. Yeah, all the thalids make saplings. This is where the sapling token creature type comes from. Uh, Magic. This was the first set to have those in it. Yeah, there we go. Giant Angry Fungus. And all of them had these abilities where you could get counters on them and you could remove the counters to do something and you would get one counter per turn and they're all awful. This is a 6 mana 6-3 six, that can, over the course of three turns, build up a regeneration shield. This was one of the better creatures in Fallen Empires. Like, six power for six mana, so de decent return on investment power-wise to casting cost, and had an ability that would stop it from dying. And remember, regeneration was terrible back then because almost everything that killed creatures had the bury keyword on it, which translated as destroy cannot be regenerated. So... The primary way to use regeneration was to keep your creature from dying in combat. As almost, I mean, burn-based removal, although some of it also stopped regeneration. Uh, incinerate, um, I think, I think disintegrate, the red X spell, also would not allow regeneration. And there are a couple creatures that could shut off regeneration too, because why not? Like her jackal from Arabian Nights. Yeah, don't really care about the goblins. Ah, there's Goblin Grenade. One of the few good cards to come out of Fallen Empires. One mana and sacrifice a goblin, deal five damage. Very mana efficient burn spell. Uh, oh yes, it does go to creatures too. I was thinking it could only go face, like it's just a lava axe that costs, you know, four less mana. But you get to, you have to sacrifice a goblin for it, but... Apparently it can go to creatures, too. I've forgotten that, because it usually wasn't relevant. You usually threw your goblin at your opponent's face when you were all done and finished the game off real quick. Similar to Fire Blast. Can go to creatures, usually didn't bother. Ah, the actual marquee card from Fallen Empires. Him to Torok. This is just such a disgusting card. Like, if you've ever played, like, the Vintage Cube or anything on Magic Online, him to, Tor him to Torok was so, so brutal when uh, Necropotence came out, and uh, around the same time, uh, the one-drop Black Vice. As I'm thinking Rack, and Rack is the opposite end of it. So, Black Vice had just gotten either restricted or finally banned from Constructed. For standard, because they had just like started splitting up um, vintage and standard as type one for vintage and type two for standard, and so they had banned uh, Black Vice or at least restricted it. I think it finally got banned completely, and that was the card. Like aggro decks would go turn one Vice to lock you out of the to put you on a clock if you were a control deck if you couldn't get the cards out of your hand fast enough. And then attempt to, like, aggro you, and they would run Channel and Fireball before Channel got banned. And the whole idea was to deal as much damage to you as possible, and then use their life total to fuel the Channel to Fireball you for the win. And Channel got banned, Black Vice at least got restricted, and then Necropotence got printed. So, the combination of all of these things came together to form what was the first real consensus tournament caliber best deck in a format i think like there, there was talk about the weissman deck in 
uh, vintage as, quote, the deck. It was called the deck uh, because it was a very good control shell. But as far as tournament domination goes, it's been a while. Like, I think aside from Urza Saga, I don't remember any format where it was literally just one deck. It was literally mono black. Like, you played mono black, or you played a deck that was meant to beat mono black, because those were the only two things that you could possibly do. People get upset nowadays when a card has, like, a 70% share <clears throat> of the tournaments. We're, we're talking, like, actual top eights that are nothing but this deck. <clears throat> or this deck and a deck that was meant only to prey upon this deck. And him to Torok was a huge, huge part of that. You can Dark Ritual used to be in the format also. So one black gave you three black. So you could reasonably go uh, ritual, ritual, him, him on turn one, and your opponent would lose four. Like you would have gotten rid of four cards from yourself, but your opponent loses four cards at random. And mulligans used to work where you could only mulligan if you had exactly no lands and revealed your hand, or exactly all lands and revealed your hand. So if you got double hymned on turn one, before like if your opponent goes first and double hymns you, or something similar, because there was also Hypnotic Spectre in the format, which is a 3-mana 2-2 two, two flyer that makes you discard at random when it hits you, you could lose literally all of the lands in your hand when you were forced onto a bad keep. Like, if you were forced to keep a two-land hand, and your two lands got discarded to some combination of him to Torok and that, th you just lost. Like, you didn't get to play Magic. You, you got to shuffle your deck, and then watch your opponent solitaire you real quick. And this thing was absolutely disgusting for that reason. So, him to Torok... Uh, Hypnotic Spectre, so those are the cards that took your opponent's cards away, and then Necropotence let you pay life to exile the top card of your deck. Like, you skip your draw step, you pay a life, you exile the top card of your deck face down. At the beginning of your end step, you got all cards that you exiled since your last uh, end step into your hand with this. So you got a fresh grip of cards every turn, your opponent's hemorrhaging cards left, right, and center, and... There, it's absolutely miserable to play against. And, yeah, and the funny thing is, like, every time somebody complains about, you know, something starting to get, like, a decent chair in the tournament and how it's making the game unfun. So, him to Torok the, was one of the most dominant cards, and everybody was asking Wizards... Uh, at the point they were asking the DCI, you know, thing that used to be connected to the number that you had that, you know, most people don't even know what DCI was. So it's the Duelist Convocation International, which was the tournament, um, the tournament group inside of Wizards that, you know, was responsible for organized play. People were asking that him to Torok get banned. When the next ban list rolled out, they banned land tax. Because one of the few decks that had any f game at all, any fight to it at all against Mono Black Necro, was a white green deck uh, originally called Urnham Geddon after Urnham Dijin and Armageddon, later Willow Geddon because it replaced the Urnham Dijin with Autumn Willow from uh, Homelands. Uh, that was the only deck that had any serious game against him. One of the key cards for beating uh, the card advantage generated by Necropotence, was the card Land Tax, originally in Legends, reprinted in 4th edition. If your opponent has more lands than you at the beginning of your upkeep, you can search your deck for up to three planes cards and add them to your hand, then shuffle. So, it let you blow up all the lands and still have lands in your hand to play. It also meant that if your opponent managed to knock lands out of your hands, because it was a one-drop, so if you, could get, if you could stick a Land Tax, you know, old-school Mono Black has no enchantment removal. Like, enchantment removal in black is literally just starting, like, the past year, year and a half. So, you stuck land tax, and they had no way to deal with it until they got up to mana for Navinral's Disc, which is a board wipe that kills all non-land permanents when it goes off. And then they would be able to, like, if you got ahead, like, you hymn them, and now they have no lands, 
in hand, well, you have lands in play, so they can go get more lands, and that's, and then they could set up Armageddon if you started to recover faster from Armageddon than them, they got more lands, or they just had lands in their hand when they cast Armageddon so they could immediately start rebuilding. So attacking the mana base was like the only realistic way to beat Mono Black, and Wizards, DCI, banned land tax and left him to Torok alone. Like, the, this thing has, like, a 90% share in tournaments, and they banned the cards that were fighting it instead. So every time I see somebody, like, oh, yeah, this format is unfun, you know, you get, like, you have to play against this deck, like, every other round or so if you're doing well. It's like, you have no idea how much worse this used to be. You would literally play the same deck every round. And you should probably be playing that deck while you're playing against it. Like, almost every round should be a mirror matchup or the one card that's trying to beat the, you know, the one deck that's trying to beat this deck. Because that's how little diversity there was in the tournament format. And instead of banning the cards that were dominating and ruining the format, they banned the cards that were fighting them. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, just... Re reliving the old, old school magic from when I started playing, when I was first learning how to uh, build decks with the idea that you were going to be playing against other people for prizes and trying to win. Uh, I remember actually liking Necropotence before it became a huge thing, but I was running it in a white-black deck, and I was using cards like Fasting from the Dark, which is a one-mana enchantment that lets you skip your draw step to gain two life, and then after it had been in play for three turns, you had to sacrifice it, it got counters on it, and I was using that in combination with Necropotence that already made you skip your draw step, so that way I could gain two life and therefore create my own Howling Mine without going down on the... Yeah. I mean, I could have just put Ivory Tower and Zoran Orb in the deck like everybody else, but the deck hadn't, like, I think that was before uh, Black Vice got restricted, so Necropotence was not a good deck if your opponent had Black Vice, because you could not go up on cards. You would get chewed to pieces by their aggro build plus uh, Black Vice combo. Uh, so anyway... Also, I noticed I have that that sigh that I do, that kind of eh, <laughs> sigh that I have. I do that a lot. Like a verbal tick, almost. A sound effect I have to make at the end of something where I'm just like, yeah, that was kind of amusing to me to reminisce about that or to see this play out in the game. Okay, getting back to the actual cards. I'm really not expecting to find anything in this set. that Because, again, the creatures are mostly terrible, but they're not, like, massive drawbacks for the opponent to have, and there's not a, any real benefit for us to be casting them. So... No, no. One ones. <clears throat> Turning lands into forests, I believe. Sacrifice a green creature to turn target land into a basic forest. Yep. Thelon's chant, Thelon's curse, Thrall champion, Thrall retainer. Oh, it is Torok. That, that has the gate. Huh. I didn't realize it was his gate. I was blanking on that. Okay. So, yeah, the Evan Prayer. Tor Torok was, like, the cult leader at the time, like, the high priest. And eventually they just kind of rework the religion to focusing on him. So, yeah, I did not actually expect to find anything in Fallen Empires other than, you know, pleasant memories of the early days of my magic career. Alright, so... F. Sorry, Fallen Empires. <clears throat> I'm gonna lean forward because of the creaky chair I'm in. I was leaning back before, but... Alright. Fate Reforged. Uh... 
Uh, beginning of your upkeep, draw a card if you control the creature with the greatest toughness or tied for the greatest toughness. Uh, probably not. Like, we do have a lot of big creatures. I don't think we're always going to have, or even consistently have, the biggest creature. Also, there are better cards for that, like ones that just care if we have like a 4-4 in play. Would be better... Uh, has lifelink as long as you control a white or black permanent. Yeah, yeah four mana, three, three is not going to do anything. Uh, enters the battlefield, choose one, put a counter on it, or search your library for a basic land card. Shuffle your library and put that card on top of it. No. See, an effect like this, if we gave it out to the opponents in the friendlier deck, that would give them a land that they had to put on top of their deck. So, you know, somebody who's, like, really behind on lands and we want to make a friend, this is a good way to give them a land without giving them any card advantage, and, you know, they don't, they get the land next turn, so we're kind of helping them out, but I don't think it's got a good enough, like, if it were just a 2-2 that did that, like, just search the deck for a land and put it on top, that would be better than what this is. But that was obviously designed with limited in mind, where you could either fix your mana or get a 2-2 two -two for two. Um, can't run Alicia because of the white in her activation. What does she get back? Two power or less? Yeah. Just has dash. 5-5. Five, five. Enters the battlefield. Return a... Return another creature you control to owner's hand. So that's not optional. We do have to watch out, because this is Commander, where comes into play abilities are the norm, but... We could actually put this in our deck, give it to somebody who just played like a big creature to try and tempo them, while giving them the 5-5 five five to attack with. For that matter, if they only have the one creature and they decide to attack us, we can just give them the Crotic and make them pick up their big creature and stop attacking us, but then, yeah, the Crotic's not attacking. Eh, we'll add it to the list. So this was Fate Reforged. There we go. Ambush. Crotic. The Q. Like I said, I'm not going to add the text now. I'll go back and add the text later. But the text is going to be relevant later on when we're trying to cut down cards. And I forget what an ambush crotic is because I'm going to forget. I forgot this card existed. And rereading it now is not going to help a couple weeks from now at the rate I'm going where we're going to have to decide what cards we're keeping. Hmm. Choose target creature. Whenever that creature is dealt damage this turn, it deals that much damage to each other creature and each player. Hmm. We are forcing a lot of big creatures to get into combat. Like, if our if we give out something like the leveler and they're forced to attack with it, and we want to wipe the board, it's really easy to just target the thing. Like, if somebody goes to block the leveler to avoid taking 10, we can just arc bond that creature, and I don't think the leveler has trample. We'll have to double-check that, but we do have a fair number of large, high-power creatures without trample that we're using for their abilities we could very easily wipe the board and deal a bunch of damage. We will take a bunch of damage as well, but since we're casting it, as long as we're ahead on life, so we're going to add Arc Bond. Uh, Defender and Reach, no. Beginning of each opponent's end step, that player chooses up to two creatures he or she controls and sacrifices the rest. Okay, so if we stole it back with the land, 
we would have it in play at the beginning of the opponent's end step when the sacrifice trigger would go on the stack. Or the exile trigger, rather, from the bullies would go on the stack. So we could actually use the Archfiend to make that player then sacrifice down to two creatures without having access to the Archfiend itself as one of the things that they sacrifice. And Archfiend is just a decent sized thing for us to have. Alright. Yeah, we need more stuff we can cast. Uh, Tarka's flying, trample, and gives double strike, but to dragons. Uh, deal four damage to any target. Cares if you control red or white permanent. True shock. Can't be blocked by more than one creature. Each creature you control with a plus one plus one counter can't be blocked by more than one creature. Um, Forcer has first strike and trample as long as an instant and sorcery are in your graveyard. Uh, target creature with power two or less gains haste until end of turn and can't be blocked this turn. So this is an enchantment version of all of the um, things that I've been looking at if we want to do like saboteurs. We haven't actually grabbed any... I think the only saboteur we've grabbed so far has been that one entropic specter that is a giant hypnotic specter. Technically a giant abyssal specter, because the opponent does get to choose what they discard. Uh, break through the line, not break the line. Alright, we won't get the Brutal Horde Chief, because he's got that hybrid red-white activate ability. Uh, sorcery that bolsters three... Deal 3 damage requires you to sacrifice a creature. Uh, yeah, we'll have better things. Similarly, Crux of Fate will have better options. Player discards all the cards in his or her hand, then draws that many cards minus 1. Yeah. Like, we do want wheel effects to discard the terrible creatures from our hand, but the that number of cards minus one I don't think is helping us. And it's not hurting the opponents enough either. So we'll just skip past that. Uh, enters the battlefield, choose one, plus one, plus one counter, or destroy target artifact. Uh, no. When it dies, destroy target non-creature permanent. Also probably no. Uh, the target opponent reveals his or her hand. You choose a non-land card from it. That player discards that card. If you control a warrior, they lose two life. Nope. Deals two damage to target creature, and you gain two life. Uh, add red to your mana pool for each attacking creature you control. Until end of turn, attacking creatures you control have red. This creature gets plus one, plus zero. Oh. Turn target creature from your graveyard to the battlefield. Dragons get two plus one, plus one counters from this. Being returned that way. 5 4 for 5. Manifest the top card of your deck. Uh, when Flame Rush Rider attacks, put a token onto the battlefield tapped and attacking that's a copy of another target attacking creature. Exile that token at the beginning of combat, and it has dash. Nope. <clears throat> Flying Haste. Flame Wake Phoenix attacks each turn if able. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, if you have power 4 or greater, you can pay red to return him. Another manifest card. Target creature's controller reveals a card at random from their hand. Friendly fire deals damage to that creature and that player equal to the reveal card's converted mana cost. Nope. Um... Frontier Mastodon enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it if you control a creature with a power four or greater. No. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Cons, you get two green at the beginning of your main phase. Dragons, creature with flying enters the battlefield under your control. You may have it fight target creature you don't control. We have a reasonable number of demons so far, but not all of them even fly. So. Okay, here's Ghastly Conscription. Exile all creature cards from target player's graveyard. In a face-down pile, shuffle that pile, then manifest those cards. So this would allow us to manifest the very high-power, terrible 
creatures that we have in our deck and then turn them face up so that they were already in play and we skip the um the comes into play abilities while getting these giant creatures. So I'm going to add that to the list. We had talked about this a little bit when I was discussing the idea... Oh, there's no E towards the end of Ghastly. When we were discussing the idea of um, Illusionary Mask, and then I found that um, basically less complex and less expensive Illusionary Mask from the one Commander set that just allows you to manifest a card from your hand as a 2-2. So, yeah, being able to use our giant angry creatures that have terrible comes and play abilities on our side without having to jump through... Like, it's a less hoops to jump through if we just put them into play face down and then turn them face up later. Like, that's usually... Fairly easy to do. Most of them have very low casting costs because there comes into play ability is what's keeping them in check. So if we can just circumvent that, we can get a lot of big creatures that way. Uh, beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice boom keg. When it's put into a graveyard from the battlefield, deals three damage. Nope. Heal cutter. Very good limited card, but not what we want. Also don't want a 4-1. Uh, put three counters on it, or wait, put the top three creature, choose target creature, put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard, then put a plus one plus one counter on that creature for each creature card in your graveyard. There we go, got there. Ah, yes, butt fight. Grim Contest allows the creature to deal damage based on its toughness instead of its power. Very good card in Limited. Again, not anything. Um, our mag angler, good card, but not with what we're doing. Uh, uh, it just has an attack restriction. There's the battlefield. Put a plus one, plus one counter on destroy target creature that was dealt damage this turn. I'd rather not give the opponent the choice. I would rather have the creature forced to kill a creature that was dealt damage this turn. Alright, so here's Humble Defector, now that we're actually in the set that Humble Defector comes from. So Humble Defector is, uh, on your turn, you can tap it to draw two cards and then give it to an opponent. It's not goaded. They get to decide who they give it to afterwards. Uh... It's not really doing much in our day. Like, we get to draw two cards, and then we get to give it away. It's one of those cards that's very good in either decks that are trying to make friends at the table and trying not to get attacked until, you know, you can get to close to heads-up play or you're just so far ahead of the two remaining players at the table that they kind of have to gang up on you, even if you were being nice to them. But... I don't know that we want Humble Defector even then. Eh, I think we can skip over it for now. We have other ways to politely allow an opponent to draw a card that we can give out that are less disadvantageous for us to just, like, if we gave it to somebody else and they passed it to one of our other opponents instead of giving it back to us because they didn't, we were, like, too far ahead on board or something. Or we suddenly became the more relevant threat, so they just kind of gave it away to another person. Or just held on to it as a 2-1 and, you know, like, used it to block or something. As long as you control green or blue permanent has flash uh, plus one plus one counter on target creature and then have it fight uh, original Colagon. each creature gets plus one plus oh until end of turn uh, <clears throat> flying haste trample and get shuffled back into the deck uh, plus two plus oh first strike as long as you control a white or black permanent. 3-1 uh, dash. 
Uh, whenever Shadow Spear attacks, each opponent loses one life. Uh, whenever Strike Leader attacks, put a 2-1 Warrior Creature token onto the battlefield. And there's another version of Fleshbag Marauder. This one's an Orc Warrior instead of a Zombie. Uh, when the size may destroy target creature with converted mana cost 3 or less. Uh, enters the battlefield under your control. Target creature and opponent controls gets minus 1, minus 1 until end of turn. Alright, Outpost Siege is the exiles the card and you can play it. And whenever a creature you control leaves the battlefield, Siege does 1 damage to target creature or player. No, yeah, probably not. An Outpost is the Raise Dead or Drain to Life. Target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Or upkeep, each opponent loses 2 life and you gain 2 life. Yep. Okay. Hmm. First Strike Trample is not terrible, but that's another 7 drop. And I think our other, like, high mana things are better. Okay, so this is mildly interesting if we have any deck manipulation. Now, I almost always wind up running Sensei's Divining Top in my commander decks because of the number of fetch lands I'm running. And that would allow us to know if the top card of our deck is one of our big creatures with a drawback that we can manifest. So we give the opponent a creature, we steal it back, and we want to sacrifice it to something. If we sacrifice it to this guy, we manifest the top card of our deck. And if it's one of the big dumb things, then now we have the big dumb thing in play. And then we can turn it face up later. So. I'm going to add this one to the list. This one has the most setup for what it's trying to do. If we want to guarantee we hit, like, you can just steal the creature back and manifest the top card of your deck, and if you manifested a land or an instant or sorcery, unless you desperately needed that, then it's not that big a deal. RC High Priest. No. High Priest is not one word. So, it might not make it, but it is repeatable. That's why I've been passing over all of these ones that just manifest the top card of your deck and then move on with their lives. Because those are not as good as a repeatable way to do that. And then, destroy to our artifact, enchantment, or creature with flying. No. Uh, choose one. Target non-attacking creature gains reach and death touch until end of turn and untap it, or target attacking creature gets plus two, plus two, and gains trample until end of turn. 5-5 five, five reach, enters the battlefield, bolster five. That might be too nice to give out. Also, it's another seven drop. I I don't want to keep adding like all these big casting cost creatures to the deck, because then we just don't have any early plays and we wind up taking way too much damage before we actually start casting any of these things. Like we're gonna have plenty of opportunities to put large creatures with interesting drawbacks or interesting while they're in play things even if we don't control them into this deck. So every time I see one of these things that oh we could give it to the opponent and it would be okay and it's like no we need to do better than okay. We need to find either cheaper creatures with good abilities or have our really expensive stuff be really good for us to have and then be okay to give out towards the end of the game to force one of the other players to, you know, get us to heads up type situation. Uh, Shamanic Revelation. Eh. I'm just thinking... We usually will have, you know, our bullies, unless they're dead, but if we have, like, some of the other creatures and we gain 8 or 12 life and draw some cards, you know, if we could draw 3 cards and gain, like, 4 to four to 12 life, then that's better than um, Harmonize, like, that's worth the 1 plus mana for Harmonize, but we actually have to be in that position. 
And if we just draw a card and gain four life, because we recast the bullies, then I don't think that's particularly good. But we haven't been great. Like, I put Phyrexian Arena on the list, and we should probably be able like, we're going to have, like, Wheel of Fortune effects, hopefully. Yeah, okay, we can skip over that. Instead of talking myself into a mediocre draw card, when we have better options for our deck. Uh, Shock Maw deals combat damage to a player. It deals one damage to each creature that player controls. Uh, if it were two damage, yes, because then we could wipe out, like, small creature boards. You know, we give it to an opponent, they have to attack. They probably, unless the, you know, it's always unless they decide that we're the main threat or that they they don't care about that particular player. Then we can usually find somebody that will use the card the way we want it to to wipe an opponent's board real quick. Uh, enters the battlefield. Each player puts the top three cards of their library into their graveyard. Not doing much for like milling three is fine, and milling the opponent's three means nothing in our deck. So uh, enters the battlefield. Return target creature from your graveyard to your hand. Dies, deals two damage to you. Hmm. I think we can do... Like, there are other effects similar to this that we can do that would be better. But I do like the idea that we give it to the opponent and they have to attack with it. And... Whereas other little creatures, you know, your opponent... The, the third opponent in this thing, like... Or the second opponent. So we have one opponent we give it to. They're attacking the other opponent. The other opponent is always incentivized to block the smaller creatures just to kill them. Rather than take the damage. Like, it's a forced attack, so they're not worried that they're playing into combat tricks. Or, you know, like a damage-based board wipe or something. So, they're more inclined to block a small creature with a larger creature and just eat it in combat which allows something like this to keep going to the graveyard and dealing two damage to whoever we gave it to, and then we can pass it around the board. Since it keeps going back to our graveyard anyway, we don't have to worry about grabbing it back and sacrificing it ourselves. But there are better creatures than this. I'm thinking like Jackal Pup right now. So when we get to Tempest, that's a card that has a lot of possibility to make it into this deck. A uh, creature with flying was exiled in this way. All right. I'm going to try moving my fan over so that it's facing me but isn't quite as close to the microphone, and I'm going to turn it on. Oh, I'm not going to turn it on because it did not like that I moved it or something. One second. There we go. All right. I don't... Now, it should be angled, it's angled away from the microphone, so hopefully we're not getting that. Actually, I can always check, right? Okay, gonna go. Tablet, over to my switch, where I should be live. Sure the volume's turned all the way up. Hmm. Okay, let's try this now. Hmm. Trying this again. I actually been muted this whole time. Like, my thing was reacting, but now I'm not getting audio from this. Because hmm. I've got the page open. And I'm seeing the same cards on the list, but I'm not getting any audio 
from my tablet. Trying this again. I muted and unmuted the microphone to see if I had it in reverse. And I'm still not getting any audio. Great, have I actually been mute this entire time? Because that's going to be really frustrating. Hang on. All right, so it's still capturing the images. Why is it not capturing the audio? I am so confused. Or is it? Is my microphone dead on this thing, maybe? Ah, the joys of having to figure out your technical issues in the middle of your stream... I mean, I'm kind of glad I needed to turn the fan on, so that way I could have to figure this out, but... Yeah, I don't seem to be muted on, like, any of this, but I'm not getting sound when I'm watching it on the tablet. Why am I not getting sound when I'm watching it on the tablet? Is the sound gate too strong? I mean, I tried recording myself before and I got audio, so I don't know why I'm not getting audio here. Have it set to that. Why am I muted? Like, it's capturing these still. Why is it not capturing sound? Audio mixer, help me out here. Hmm. No, it's still that. That's also still that. And I see the thing going up and down. Why is it not capturing sound? Like, I am so confused as to why it's doing this now. Uh, so I've been muted this whole time, and I don't know why. Why is... OBS not capturing sound now. Obviously, this has to do with me setting up the sound gate, but I can hear myself when I talk. So why can I not... Why is the... Why is the stream not getting it? Oh my god. Help me out. What am I doing wrong? That one has no filters. 
one has the noise gate set up. But it's only things that are below this range. So I'm getting above it. So and we are still capturing this stuff. Why are we not capturing my audio anymore? Thing help me out. I have no idea what I did. Filters. Okay, that's not it. What did I do? Why do I not have audio now? How did I do this? I have no idea how I did the thing that I'm now trying to correct. So what is scene one then? Like Wait, hang on. Bring this up for a second. Okay, did we get it back? Did this do anything? Did this do anything at all? Uh, I am messing so much with my own thing right now, and... I really don't know... How else to fix this? Uh, we are going to figure it out. We are going to do this live and we are going to figure it out. Microphone, Blue Yeti, okay. Filters, noise gate, close. Have my thing there. Why did we just make a box like that? Please don't make boxes like that. I don't need... Have gatherer... <sighs> Keeps trying to reposition all of my stuff, and... I don't need it repositioned. I need it, like, a size that I can manage while I'm trying to read it. Alright, this... This one needs to be over there. This thing, I don't even know what that is. So it definitely doesn't need to be like scene transitions, not something I'm normally trying to do. We shrink that down, put it over top of this one. And we need this thing, because that's how I start and stop the stream, and put that back over here. I have n literally no idea what I did that I have no audio now, 
and it's really frustrating. And you can't hear how frustrated I am, which might be good, because I am very, very annoyed right now. That is not helping anything. Like, it has the microphone as a source. Why can it... Why can I not hear myself? How did I mute the stream somehow? I would like to know this. This is important. Can somebody please tell me how the... I did this. <laughs> No sources selected. Right. Now, sources are over here. Also, now I've buried my, like, viewing window down here. I can't see that properly anymore. This is... This is just wonderful. This is a thing that is happening now, and I don't know how I did it. What did I do? Literally, what did I do here? Is it really... Is it my tablet? Oh, okay, we're going to Twitch real quick on my desktop. As you can it's see... It's 80% mean in this game. Absolutely oh, no. nothing. Oh, go to my channel. Yeah. Sorry, Octo. Going to my channel. As you can it's see... It's 80% mean in this game. Absolutely oh, no. nothing. Oh, go to my channel. Okay. It's Sorry, Octo. I am getting audio. Going to my channel. As you can it's see... It's 80% mean in this game. I am getting audio. Nothing. Okay, so go I was just not channel. getting okay. audio Sorry, on my Octo. tablet. Why am I, I not am getting, getting audio, audio on my tablet? my channel. As you can see, eighty percent mean in this game. I'm getting I'm audio. Really okay, so I was just not channel. getting okay. audio on my tablet. Now I'm getting audio on my channel. As you can see, eighty percent mean in this game. I'm getting audio. Okay, so I was just not getting audio on my tablet. Now I'm getting audio on my tablet. Now I'm now I sound really angry on my tablet. I'm getting audio. Okay, so I was just not getting audio on my tablet. Now I'm getting audio on my tablet. Now I now I sound really angry on my tablet. I'm getting audio. Okay, so I was just not getting audio on my tablet. Now. I'm getting I'm audio getting on my tablet. Yeah, now, now, now I sound really I'm, angry I'm, on my tablet. I'm getting audio. Okay, so I was just not getting okay. audio on my tablet. Now I'm getting audio on my tablet. Now, now I sound really angry. Okay, muted the muted my muted my stream from watching it on Twitch. So I am still getting audio. I don't know why my tablet before was not picking up audio then. That was really super weird. Ah, the joys of doing things live when you don't know exactly what you're doing. I have no idea why that was. Alright, but apparently I've fixed it now. Alright, we need to get rid of Twitch because otherwise we are getting that little infinite thing over here, so we're gonna drop that, go back to the cards. I have no idea how that happened. I have no idea why that was happening. It's very frustrating, but here we are. Okay, so that was a fun adventure. I hope you enjoyed hearing me get more and more aggravated. I don't know why you would enjoy that. It seems like a terrible thing to enjoy. Uh, uh, that seems how like how you attract you know extra trolls is that they find out that it's super easy to annoy you or that annoying you is fun. Like, they like the way you get annoyed. <sighs> okay. So, now that I've solved that problem, so this is going to be great during the playback. There's just going to be, like, five or ten minutes of me just going, why is my audio not working? Why can't I get the audio to work? Meanwhile, you can hear me perfectly fine. Just like, but why is the audio not working? <sighs> okay. Alright, so put my headphones back on so I can hear my voice in my own ears again, which is another reason why I couldn't figure out why it wasn't working is that I'm getting audio over here. 
But enough on that. Let's get back to this. So, put four cards from your library into your graveyard. Return a creature and a land from your graveyard to your hand. No, dies, manifest the top card of our library. That's the other enchant creature that cares about the colors we have. Can't run Tassiger because he activates for blue. There's Temper Battle Rage. Temper Battle Rage is one of those cards that I kept mentioning before because we're going to be giving out large angry creatures, and some of them don't have Trample, but they definitely have high power. Although we won't control them, so we need our bullies or one of our other high power creatures in play. Um, but we're going to take Temer Battle Rage, because when we give one of the giant creatures double strike, it's just going to kill the opponent that it's attacking. And that seems perfectly valid for what we're trying to do. Alright, there's a, going to be a green one that has, as long as we control the other two colors. Uh, return another creature we control to owner's hand to give this indestructible? No. That's actually a really good card against us, because... They they can give us our bad creature back to our hand. Uh, ETBs manifest the top card of your library. Whenever opponent you control is turned face up, if it's a creature, you may have it fight target creature you don't control. Okay, but not great. Also, it's a six drop, and I'm kind of trying to... I mean, it is okay if we do the putting our terrible creatures into play face down and then turning them face up because this will work with the manifest or the um the mask the illusionary mask so and those creatures will be large and it is a may i'm gonna add it to the list just to be safe maybe we'll cut some of the other large um creatures that aren't doing much and use this one instead of them. Uh, 1-1 one, one Death Touch. 4-5 uh, enters the battlefield, sacrifice a permanent. Ooh! That's a fun one to give them. So, they can't sacrifice the Construct because it doesn't have a color. So they're going to have to sacrifice one of their other... They, they'll be able to keep like their lands and most of their mana rocks if not all of them and you know ra random other things but they will have they will almost have unless you're playing against like Kozilek Butcher of Truth or uh, Great Distortion Great Distortion is the one that usually shows up as the commander like you're playing against one of those they're going to have yep no okay I've talked myself into this one yeah this is another one that you're going to want to have for the, um, whatchamacallits. Wow. My brain just kind of stopped working there, didn't it? Uh, this is another one you're going to want to have to just give to your opponents because it's terrible for them when it comes into play, and then they have to attack. Like, it doesn't give them the option to not do the terrible thing. Like, they either have to have a deck that can't do the terrible thing, or they're stuck with it. And then they have to attack somebody else. So yeah, that one's actually perfect for this deck. Uh, it is something we can cast if we don't mind. If we have a permanent that we can get rid of. It's still terrible, though. I would not want it. Great, now that my microphone's back, it keeps peaking. <laughs> and I don't know... I don't know if it ever actually went away. But... It seemed to have gone away, and now that I'm very hyper-cognizant of it, I keep seeing it, like, getting up into the red, so I hope that's not bothering any of you who have found this stream or the VOD for it over on my YouTube channel and are giving me a chance, and now I'm trying to murder your ears with my mouth. I apologize for that. As you can tell, I am still very new to this. This is, like, week three of me trying to do... Uh, streaming. This is the one that keeps manifesting, right? Uh, beginning of your end step, manifest the top card of your library. Sacrifice this until end of turn, face up non-token creatures you control game when this creature dies, manifest the top card of your library. So we can... Giving this to the opponents, like, they can sacrifice it so that their stuff 
that dies gives them the top card of their deck as a 2-2 and then can be turned face up later into the creature form. Uh, but it also just keeps letting us manifest the top card of our deck every turn. And that might be worth the effort, more so than even the uh, War Shaman, since he only manifests the one time himself and needs the other cards that manifest to... This does fall into the category that I talked about in one of my other things, where we're potentially creating a sub-theme here that interacts with the main theme really well, but isn't you know, exactly what we were going for when we started building the deck. So, we're going to try to not have, like, we're going to pick a bunch of cards that work with it, but we're going to have to be aware that we might wind up cutting literally all of them to focus on our main theme. Uh, manifest the top card with counters, prevent all combat damage, control creature with power 4 or greater, prevent all combat damage to be dealt this turn by creatures your opponents control. Eh. And we can't use Yosova. Alright, well, Fate Reforged took way longer than expected, primarily because of issues. Alright. I wonder how many times my issues are going to be just on my end and me trying to f solve them and that's going to leave my audience going. And this is still in the video for some reason. That's because I haven't really learned to edit videos yet. Like, so you are just getting the raw, unfiltered streams and that's why you're getting all of this. On the bright side, I think this is relatively fine for a new person to have all of their issues, because a lot of times you will see people who have been doing this for a while, and they have all of their stuff figured out, and even if they have an issue, it's a couple clicks, and they've figured it out, because they know what the issue was from having dealt with it before, but this is, you are seeing somebody who is doing this for the first time, and encountering this problem for the first time, and so you're getting the, you're getting to see like, the whole thing, and I think that that sort of thing is good to have, especially if you improve dramatically over time, and you actually build, so if this thing actually works out, and I start building magic decks on stream as a thing in the future, and this just becomes what I do, I think it'll be good to have moments like this in the archives where it's just like, no, you do have to start from somewhere. Things do have to go wrong. You don't get to just everything is perfect all of the time and you can't just go, well, it, you know, the stream went horribly wrong here and everything is ruined and just throw your hands up and be done with it. Because there's a lot of that in everything, including magic and where when you're new to it and you hit the frustrating parts and you can't figure out what's wrong, where you need to figure out a way to get through that and over that, and that's in everything, so. And a lot of people will present, you get presented with after they have gotten over a lot of those hurdles and they come into it and it's like, okay, now everything looks professional and everything's good and things almost never go wrong, and when they do, the person in control of the stream or whatever else, they just fix it and move on, and it's done. Cool. And that's not how 90% of life works. So, and when you're only presented with the finished product and the person who knows more or less exactly what they're doing, you don't get... Um, you get the impression that it's you, that there's something wrong with you, and you're not getting it. Why can't you do it like everybody else does, and nobody does it like that until they've been doing it for forever. So, enjoy that little life lesson. Everybody's terrible in the beginning, and you just have to keep going at it and figure stuff out as you go along and improve and eventually you will get to that point but you have to go through all of this first you don't just start there or 
you know, it's not like it's super easy and there was no learning curve and you just knew it and, or, you know, the person you're watching just knew it and meanwhile you can't figure it out, you must be stupid. No, 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 they actually had to go through all of this, they just went through it somewhere else and you didn't get to see it and now you're seeing the finished product and it's like, oh yeah, no, everything goes great for them all the time, must be nice. Alright, so we scrolled down a little too fast. This one gives you three life when it dies. Uh, can block as though it have flying, so it's a 2-6 reach. More modular shenanigans, which we didn't take from Darksteel, where modular was stronger. They toned down modular in this set because Arcbound Ravager was such a savage beating. And then they went with, like, the Sunburst thing instead, and... Since Sunburst affects casting, I don't think we're going to pick up a lot of cards from this set, but... We're going to look and see what happens. Um, take an insect for each forest you control. Oh, this is the green beacon. Um, red beacon, black beacon. Black beacon makes it into a lot of my commander decks just because the um, effect is so powerful. Like, everybody has really cool creatures. We're actually building one of the rare decks where you don't want to steal your opponent's stuff. And even then, that's one deck out of, like, four at the table, including yourself. Like, you will usually have, like, two or three players at the table that you would love to reanimate one of their good value creatures with a beacon. Uh, so we can do Fifth Dawn. I think I actually did, like, number five. Nope, okay, I did spell it Fifth Dawn. Yep, yeah, there we go. I think I used to have it as the number 5, like, 5th. We're going to add Beacon just as one of the utility cards. Even if we don't want to reanimate our own stuff, we and we will have a few things we want to reanimate, but most of the stuff we want to reanimate is going to be from the opponent anyway. Also, it can steal artifacts from graveyards, and artifacts are always good times to steal, because there's Everybody's running either mana rocks or good utility artifacts in their deck. And sometimes, like, decent artifact creatures that we would want to bring back, so. We can't use any of the bringers because they have that five color activation. Can't use that. That's not going to do anything. Yeah, most of these we're just going to gloss over because they're not doing anything. Can't run him because he's five colors. Uh, trample, at the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice this unless you sack two lands. Uh, this is one of the ones where we would want to have it face down, like with one of the other cards, because it's the upkeep where it's the problem, and it doesn't have haste. We can give it away, because then it's a 7-6 trampler. But the difference when we're giving away between a 7-6 and a 7-1 is not only negligible, but... Unless the opponent has a first strike creature, the one toughness is actually better because then it's easier for it to die in combat. And then we don't have to grab it back and sacrifice it in order to get it off the board so that we can reuse it later. Um, we're not really doing land shenanigans. Like, Crucible of Worlds gets into some of my decks just because of all the fetch lands. Because if you get a fetch land and you get the three man. you cast Crucible of Worlds, you're never going to miss another land drop for the rest of the game that you don't want to until you run out of fetchable lands in your deck. So Crucible of Worlds is a card that can make it into a lot of my decks just for utility purposes. It's not really what we're doing here. I think we can pass on it. Like, we don't really have... We would run this one over a lot of the green ones, like Ranunap Excavator. Because that being a creature is more of a liability. Like, we don't want um, our Crucible effect to die from removal because we want to keep getting value from it. And Random Crucible usually sits in play until somebody blows up multiple artifacts in a single go. Or until they get a random effect that will blow up an artifact that they need to use, like destroy target artifact and do something else. And Crucible just happens to be like one of the better artifacts in play that they can blow up. So, usually most people don't find a Crucible threatening until you prove that you can either go infinite with it, or let's say play against a lot of people that go infinite with it, then Crucible's just like, oh yeah, must kill. Uh, I played against too many decks that go, you know, 
Crucible and just generate infinite mana by generating land plays. I don't know. Aside from Fast Bond, I'm so used to the Fast Bond um, Zoran Orb Crucible combo where you can sack a land for two life and then pay one life to play an extra land for the turn and then play that land from your graveyard, tap it for mana, sack it to gain two life. So now you have infinite mana and infinite life. But, of course, Fast Bond is banned in Commander because it does things like that and being able to use your life total as a resource in Commander way more potent than when when you start off with twice as much life. Life as a resource for as an engine to exchange life for another resource tends to be viewed as more degenerate with the higher starting life total. That's why cards like uh, Yawgmoth's Bargain and Channel are banned, because if you had to pay three quarters of your starting life total to cast an Emrakul on turn two, that's great in a heads-up game. But when you have to pay, you know like, half that much, because now you have double the life total to, to get something that big on turn two now, and it doesn't get interacted with cheap spells as well, then that becomes way more of an issue. Emrakul, of course, did get herself banned from Commander, mostly for the ability to go infinite with her, and cards like... So, Emrakul is one of those legendary creatures that's not banned because it's too good as a commander. Emrakul is one of those legends that gets banned because it's too good in the 99. Uh, particularly with uh, the original Captain Sisse, who can tap to tutor a legendary uh, permanent from your, hand, from your deck into your hand. Uh, because Emrakul always shuffles herself back in when she goes away, you could cast Emrakul, get the extra turn, go to your extra turn, attack with Emrakul, sacrifice her, shuffle her back into your deck, tap Captain Sisse to get her back into your hand and cast her again and go infinite that way. And if you think 15 mana hard cast is too hard to get to in Commander, you should see some of the things that you can do if you have the right cards. Because it is very reasonable if that is your goal. Like, if that is the sole goal of your deck, it is very reasonable to ramp both lands and artifacts and creatures to the point where everything is gaining you mana every turn until you hit critical mass and can cast Emrakul and take over the game. Like, casting, hard, being able to hard cast Emrakul is probably doable by, like, turn 5 or 6. Like, to loop her that way. And moving on... This is another one because you can just sacrifice the Desecration Elemental first. Unless uh, the players want to gang up on the person, you give Desecration Elemental two. Like, if we give them Desecration Elemental, and then one person casts a spell and triggers Desecration Elemental, well, they're going to just sacrifice the Elemental to get it off of the board. But if that player or another player can cast another spell... Now they have two instances of must sacrifice a creature on the stack, and the desecration elemental going away doesn't cancel that out, so they'll sacrifice the desecration elemental first, but then they have to lose one of their actual creatures that they had. And this can keep going if enough players want... Like, if you give this to the player that's way far ahead on board, and the players can... Especially, the problem is, is that the instants and sorcerers can't be killing the creatures, because otherwise the ones that are being targeted will get sacrificed, and it's basically the same thing as not having had the elemental in play in the first place. But if you can, like, you know, naturalize, if you can, like, cross and grip one of their artifacts, or something along those, like, destroy an artifact, destroy an enchantment, draw some cards, and as an instant, you know, just keep putting the trigger onto the stack, eventually they would burn through their actual creatures. That being said, it's still not that good. I'm looking for, like, large creatures with terrible drawbacks, but unfortunately that one... Like, this one, you're going to ca you're going to give it to them, they're going to attack, the defending player is going to go, I can't block this, I cast an instant targeting anything of yours or anything of anybody else's for that matter, or drawing a card or whatever... You have to sacrifice a creature. Unless that player actually 
desperately wants the player dead also, they're going to sacrifice Desecration Elemental and keep their actual stuff. So... Uh, whenever a player plays a spell, you lose one life. This is a similar vein. <clears throat> like, if players can cast spells real quick while this, while this person is afflicted with this creature, it's also a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three flyer. So, it, it's a small, evasive creature. It's bad for us, though. Like, early game... There's not... There, people are going to be playing mana rocks and ram spells. So, if we cast this on turn 3... We're probably going to lose like four to six life to it before it dies. And that does not seem worth it for something that's going to attack for a grand total of like nine or twelve divided up among three or four players. <clears throat> uh, it does have the benefit that players aren't going to necessarily want to kill it if it's not attacking them. Because if you're losing all of that life that's usually worth letting you keep the 3-3 three, three flyer in a format where everybody's at 40 to start with. <clears throat> like, if you if you go to 28 because of your own creature and, <clears throat> you know, you, you manage to deal, you know, 15 or 21 damage spread across <clears throat> the other three or four players. <clears throat> Sorry, I think I need to get some more. I'm actually out back here. So I'm going to mute the mic and I'll be back. All right, and I'm back. I'm still a little bit raspy, but hopefully that clears it up a little bit. <clears throat> All right. So yeah, the we're probably not running Evan Drake. <clears throat> Even though it's a decent negative thing to give away. Eternal Witness does make it into almost all of my green commander decks. It's just too much value not to consider including. I think we're going to put her in. We do want ways to get back. Like, we don't want our big, terrible creatures we're trying to put into the graveyard, but we do need back the other stuff that enables things, or that draws us cards, or the creatures that we can cast. <clears throat> so we need a couple of ways to get those back. So we're just going to add Eternal Witness to the deck list just as one of those utility cards that makes it in by default. Back in Creatures Gain Trample. <coughs> oh, nope. Thought I had... cleared my throat out a bit, but I guess not. All this talking. All this time. Hey. Uh, is unblockable. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you may remove a counter from target permanent. We have better options for taking counters off of stuff or interacting with things, I think. We could give out Vampire Hex Mage <clears throat> at that point and take all of the counters off of it. Like, if we give somebody Vampire Hex Mage when they agree that this thing is the problem, that's a very easy, here you go, take this 2-1, sack it, remove all the counters from that permanent, move on with our lives. Uh, discard an artifact to give it plus two, plus two. Has fire breathing. 
First strike can't be equipped. One damage to target creature or player and sacrifice the cannon. War gear, granulate, no. Which one is the one that lets you sack a creature? I just saw grinding station. I think I like move past the other stations because they are not particular. Like the stations are meant to come together to form an engine where you do the thing and it keeps um, chaining all of the other engines together. Okay, so it's three mana. Sacrifice a creature. Deals one damage to target creature or player. And whenever a creature comes into play, you may untap Blasting Station. <clears throat> okay, so we'll have better sack outlets. I could not remember what the Sacrifice a Creature member of the stations did. Because we do want to be able to sacrifice our creatures when we steal them back. Like, that's been a whole recurring thing that I'm wanting to do with this deck. So I wanted to be reminded what the one that Sacrifices Creatures did. In case we wanted to combine... Combine it with the other, so when we grab our creature back, we need we need things that we're getting value for sacrificing our creatures for. <clears throat> and we haven't had a particularly good one yet. So, I was wondering, but apparently it's not as good as other options I'm sure we're going to find later. Sacrifice an artifact. Oh, sacrifice two artifacts to destroy target artifact. Uh, target creature can't block this turn. Good old KCI. That's one of those cards that was like a big tournament thing, and I never remember that that's what KCI stands for at first. I have to take a few seconds to remember. Because I wasn't following uh, Tournament Magic super hard when Crackland Ironworks came into Modern again as, like, this engine that just infinite comboed people. And then it got banned out of the format. Speaking of things that got banned out of formats, Lantern of Insight. So Lantern of Insight is one of my favorite things. So when um, Theros, for... Theros Beyond Death. Um, Theros Beyond Death? No, maybe it was the original Theros. Which was the one... Yeah, it was original Theros. It was Elspeth's son's champion and Corsair of Kufrik. So, okay. So, during original uh, Theros block, there was a block-constructed Pro Tour. And almost every deck was banned. If it wasn't Bant, it was some combination of those three colors with, like, a couple of decks using black or red. But almost every deck in the format was taking advantage of three cards, and those three cards were Prophet of Crufix, or not Prophet of Crufix, Prophet of Crufix is the um, one that got banned from Commander, uh, Corsair of Crufix, the two green and one centaur that lets you play land from the top of your deck. Um, the uh, Mono Blue Sphinx, that was a 3-5, that when it attacked, you got to scry three. And Elspeth's Sun's Champion, the six drop, plus one, make three one ones. And you could minus her to wrath away all creatures with power four or greater, which is why the three five Sphinx was such a huge deal. Like anything that could punch through it would get killed by Elspeth's Wrath, but it wouldn't get killed by Elspeth's Wrath type of thing. And then her ultimate gave like all of your creatures plus two, plus two, like an emblem for plus two, plus two, and some ability keywords. So, uh, I had opened three copies of Pixis of Pandemonium in three different languages. Pixis of Pandemonium is, you can pay one and tap it, exile the top card of each player's deck face down, and you could sacrifice it to let all players put all permanents exiled by it onto the battlefield. It was supposed to be Pandora's Box. Like, you filled it up with, with all the terrible things in the world, and then you opened it up and let it, all of those terrible things out. I have been joking that with everybody having Corsair of Crufix in their deck, they should have Pixis of Pandemonium also, because Corsair makes everybody play with the t Well, not everybody. Everybody who has a Corsair has to play with the top card of their deck revealed. And if you're looking at Lantern of Insight right now, you might, and you know what Lantern Control is, you might know where this is going. 
So, <clears throat> I was like, we should run Pixis of Pandemonium because everybody is playing with the top card of their deck revealed. So, if you have a land and your opponent has a spell you don't want to deal with, or if the top card of your deck is so much worse than the top card of their deck, you can just exile both of them. And then, like, when they reveal it, like, they go to they go to end turn, and you know that next turn they're going to be drawing this, and you're just going to be drawing that, and you don't care about that, just exile it. <clears throat> and you never have to crack the Pixis and give them the stuff back. You just use this to stop the opponent from ever drawing anything relevant. Fast forward a couple years, and Lantern Control starts showing up in uh, Modern. And Lantern Control uses... Lantern of Insight, so that everybody has to play with the top card of their deck revealed, and several cards that have tap uh, both players mill the top card of their deck. <coughs> Excuse me. Gonna grab some more water. So, this was around the time that I'd stopped really caring about constructed magic. Like, the only time I build constructed decks really anymore is if I'm going to a big event, or if, <clears throat> which I haven't been doing, I mean, most people haven't been doing because there haven't been big events, but even, like, in the year or two leading up to when the coronavirus started, I had not been going to large constructed events. I was usually looking to do limited events, because... Limited is where most of my tournament prowess still lies and has been more of a passion for me, and I just love to play Limited. If I have a choice, I will always do a draft or even a sealed deck before any constructed format <clears throat> for a tournament play. But anyway, so one of the places that I was drafting at regularly had a modern event on one of the other nights, <clears throat> and... They, were, they know that I have a massive collection and could play Modern, and they were always looking for more players to get into it, and they were like, Pat, you should come play Modern, and I was like, I don't really feel like building a deck for a constructed format. <clears throat> so, when I saw how miserable, how absolutely miserable Lantern Control is to play against, that made me go, you know what... I, I don't really want to play Constructed, and I don't want to build Constructed, but just how awful this deck is makes me want to try it. Like, as somebody who loves to draft, like, the absolute most degenerate deck possible, like, I love formats where there is a deck that if it comes together, opponents basically get ground out by it, like... They either kill it very quickly, or they stumble even a little bit, and they never get anywhere near winning a game, no matter what your life total goes down to. Like, they never really had a chance to it. This is that kind of deck where, once it locks in, the opponent does not get out of it without the most miraculous of draws. And you don't know that you're dead. There's like always like a half a percent outer where... You will your deck will be stacked with enough stuff that no amount of them milling it with their mill cards is going to get through all of it to let you draw like the one terrible card and keep doing that so that you never draw another relevant spell again. So you're never actually dead. So if it's a tournament and you care about your results at all, you have to play it out knowing that you're not going to win almost every single time. That it gets to that point. It is... So, I go in one day for the draft, and I say to one of the guys that I that also goes to Modern, has been trying to get me, I was like, I finally saw a Modern deck that I kind of want to... that makes me almost consider playing Modern. And the guy's like, oh, that's so cool. You know, what is it? And I'm just like, it's called Lantern Control. And the look on his face... Like, because at first, there, there was, like, a big smile. It's like, oh, great. You know, Saber's finally seriously considering playing Modern with us. Immediately, all hopes are dashed. And he just goes, Saber, that's... That's, like, the antithesis of Modern. And I was like, huh. Well, considering how much lack of interest I've had in it, maybe that's why this deck makes me want to play it. <laughs> uh, so that's... That's my commentary on Lantern of Insight.
Yeah, no, that the deck is genuinely awful. Like, it is a miserable slog to play against. I'm kind of... The fact that it, as far as I know, it's still 100% legal. I don't know if Modern has finally moved to a point where it can't win as consistently. There's just enough outs to it. There's enough removal for all of its artifacts that it never really gets going. Or maybe it is still a thing, and I just don't follow Modern enough to know that, but... Yeah, the first time I saw Lantern Control back when it first debuted, I was just like, this, this deck is dumb and I kind of want to do it. Hmm. Yeah, Magma Elemental's okay, but not great. I think we would rather have, um, like the Worm, Massacre Worm, as our way to kill a bunch of two toughness creatures in a single turn for seven mana. In fact, I think the Massacre Worm's only six on top of that. But. Let's try and get through some more cards. Uh, I know the Vampire's a little bit silly. Each creature you control is a Vampire in addition to its other creature types and has whenever this creature deals damage to a creature, put a plus one plus one counter on the creature that had this ability. Okay. I think the one vampire from Return to Ravnica, the one that gives all of your stuff counters based on the amount of damage it dealt to the opponent, probably better at the 6-drop slot. I forget what her name is now. Um, yeah, I'm going to blank on it, and I've already rambled enough. Let's try and find some other cards that are... No. Matter of fact, put New Grave from play, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. No. Which is power and toughness. Bell suit has blue activated ability. Plus one for each artifact you control. Uh, counter target activated ability from an artifact source and destroy that artifact if it's in play. <clears throat> I mean, probably not. We need the opponent to have green, which now we're having to run Yavamaya, like the Modern Master or Modern Horizons to Yavamaya, that is an Urborg but for green, in order to give the players that we're giving this thing access to the green mana necessary to use the ability to counter an artifact that we both agree is terrible if it if its ability goes off like a Nev's disc or an O Stone or something. Uh, destroy target artifact or destroy target land. No. It's a wall. Uh, the so-called fixed Masticore. Uh First strike, beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice it unless you discard a card. Beginning of your draw step, you may have it deal three damage to target creature. Yeah, no. Deal sir hand, you may copy an instant or sorcery card from it and play the copy without paying its mana cost. No. Uh, untap all of your lands, or make them two twos, or do both. Uh, return target non-creature artifact with CMC one or less from your graveyard to play, and whenever a creature is put into the graveyard from play, untap it. Uh, plus five, plus O oh in haste, and it's a sorcery. Uh, entire opponent reveals their hand. No. Silent Arbiter goes in my Super Friends five color Planeswalker deck just to stop opponents from being able to murder all of my Planeswalkers in combat real quick. <clears throat> I am really sad that this one works, but ones like Crawl Space don't, because the Crawl Space is specifically you cannot be attacked by two or more creatures, so it has no effect on opponents attacking Planeswalkers. Oh, good. Did, did, did Magic actually... Wizards.com is down for routine server maintenance. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. Well, that's going to put an end to my ability to do this right now. We stopped on 5th dawn, page 2, due to Watsy server maintenance. Eh, 
Okay, then. Well, that's going to forcibly end our stream, since that's the thing that I'm using in order to look up cards, and we can't really look up the cards if the thing is dead. Uh, well, we had some fun. The, you know, for a little while there, it looked like we could not be heard. So, that created a major distraction, and now, you know, server issues. All right. Uh, we should probably save real quick before we forget. Okay. Well, that's going to do it for this stream. I am considering um, doing another draft. Who knows if the arena servers are currently online or not. So my first draft, I did. I just recorded it through OBS and posted it as opposed to uh, streaming it because I can't see stream chat while I am uh, playing, because I'm on full screen and I only have the one screen set up right now, like I don't have a dual monitor set up where I'd be able to see what's going on and actually moderate chat. You know, because knowing my luck, as soon as I can't see chat, somebody's going to come in and start talking, and A, I'm not going to be able to acknowledge them or interact with them, so they'll just be like, oh, New streamer doesn't even care about people that come into their chat. Okay, I'm out. Or they're going to be somebody with malicious intent who's going to start spamming the chat with horrible things that are getting around any of the preset sensors, and I'm not going to be paying attention to them to ban them, and then Twitch is going to be like, why did you allow this person to come in here and start spouting all of this? And I'm going to be like, um, because I am terrible and new at this, and I did not actually realized that they were doing it at the time and I could not stop them because I did not know and they're going to be like well one of two things are either going to be like well this is your first warning and if you keep letting this happen we're just going to kick you off the platform because this is not what we want or they're just going to do that right then and there and then I'm going to have this microphone that I spent $200 on and this setup that I took all this time to do and I'm going to be sad okay well that's enough for right now. I'm going to see about possibly doing a... I might... What I might do, since the recording got a little bit choppy in the video, not the audio, I might switch uh, chat to emo only and then stream the draft and then post it later on. But we're going to stop here. So if you found this and you're enjoying this, thanks for watching. Feel free to check out uh, the other parts of this video to see how we got started and the long road it's taken to get to this point all of about three weeks but it's been a learning experience every single time and each stream has its own interesting little mess up here and there where things went horribly wrong and I had to figure out how to work around it but yeah, we've been selecting cards for two different builds of the Beamtown Bullies, so eventually we're going to get through all of this. I thought this would go faster, but I'm also used to just being able to sit down at my computer for like an hour or two and do this, you know, whenever. And uh, But now that I don't have to worry about the microphone picking up the background noises and, you know, adding things that I did not want to my stream, you know, like my family interacting or, um, you know, music in the background that might get a copyright strike or anything like that. Now that I'm taking care of all of those, maybe I'll start streaming a little bit more on, like, my days where I'm, you know, going to go to work or coming home from work, you know, just do, like, a quick little one for, like, 30 minutes or something, get a set or two done and move on with my life so that way we can get through this a little bit faster eventually we're going to build the two decks one of them is going to be a more political uh make friends um you know try and keep the table from aggressively attacking us while we're doing our thing and keep the game moving by encouraging other players to attack with the things that, like, we're giving out things they have to attack with but we're also going to try and give them a few positive abilities in there to benefit, like let the player that's losing get some extra value while they're attack while they're using our creatures to beat up our mutual opponents type of thing. Ooh, excuse me. <clears throat> and then the other one's just going to be absolutely putting the worst creatures into play under our opponent's control. Things that <clears throat> 
more or less take that player out of the game or cripple them and keep doing that to each opponent while we have a handful of actually playable creatures that we use to win the game and the opponents are being forced to attack each other rather than focus us entirely because of the things that we're giving out. <clears throat> so those are the two versions of the deck I'm working on. So if you like what you're seeing, uh, feel free to check out the other videos. I'm going to try and keep improving in each video so that we get a more consistent uh, build for, like, so that we make progress, basically. Like, th this has been a lot slower than I thought it was going to be when I initially started, even knowing that the process takes a lot of time. So we're going to see what we can do to speed it up. Like I said, I'm going to be adding my own notes the way I have been in the other videos outside of this stream now. So that way you don't have to watch me enter every single thing in. Like, you know what the cards do. You saw them. It's important to, you know, note the things when you're writing them down. So that way when you're making cuts, you know why you thought this was a good idea for the deck. And any relevant factors like creature type matters. Even if your deck's not a uh, tribal theme, you're going to find cards that interact with the strategy that you want, and some of them are all going to be the same creature type. And it's important to know that in case you get something that both interacts with the thing that you're doing and cares about that creature type at the same time, like how many things are actually that creature type. Like, you know, if you're building an Artifact Matters deck and you have a bunch of goblins that care about artifacts and a bunch of pirates that make treasure and the treasures would be good with the as like some of the artifacts to trigger all your artifact matters cards and then you get like you know a pirate that makes treasure based on the number of pirates you have or lets your pirates make treasure when they deal combat damage you know you need to know that which ones of these are pirates versus which ones are rogues or you know other creature types so that you know which ones are going to get the benefits from that and whether or not you can double or triple up on your artifact production by having this pirate and those pirates in play type of thing. Where, you know, you're an artifact matters deck, why do you care if your creatures are pirates or not? That's why. So it, it helps to have notes on, you know, when the creature is that creature type. It also, if you're building a deck that wants to, you know, blink all of its creatures, you need to know which of the blink effects do it until end of turn and which ones uh, remove the creature and then immediately return it because that changes what you can do with the cards. And even though they're both doing the same basic thing and letting you do what your deck cares about, they're letting it do it in different ways that change which cards have value. If you're doing more out of play and immediately back to play, you get access to more cards that interact as instants. So counter spells and creature removal in the middle of combat. But if you do things that bring it back at the end of turn, you get to dodge mass removal or take your creature out of contention for what's going on on the table and then have it come back into the board later on when all of that's done. So, you know, like if you're being made to sacrifice your strongest creature and your strongest creature wanders off, and you sacrifice your second strongest creature, and then the strongest one comes back, and everybody else lost, like, their biggest creature, then now maybe you have a much better board position. So it's very important to note what your cards that you're thinking about using actually do, not just so that you remember, like, why you thought they were good for the deck, but also how they're going to interact with the other cards, so that way when you're trying to cut, like, 15 cards that do basically the same thing down to, like, 5 cards, like the 5 best ones, you know exactly which ones do what in the context of, like, relative to each other, like, so that way you're picking the actual 5 best ones, not, you know, you wrote that it blinks the creature and you don't know which ones are until end of turn and which ones happen right now, and that's going to be... And now you have to go back and check every single one of them to figure out. So if you just write that down ahead of time, when you're actually trying to cut, like, the two or three hundred cards down to 60 cards so that you can do 60 spells, 40 lands, it's just way easier that way. All right, I said I was going to end stream, like, you know, probably like five, ten minutes ago, and then started rambling. But we're going to stop stream now. Thanks for checking me out, and I'll see you next time.